Hey y'all, it's Brittany. Welcome back to my channel. This week in True Crime and Makeup, we are gonna be talking all about Mr. Larry Jean Bell. Now, this is another story that kind of turned into a rabbit hole for me, and I'll tell you why in just a bit. But if you wanna hear all about this story, make sure you stay tuned. All right, you guys, so for those of you who have been riding with me since the beginning, my true busy bees, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you guys. We have officially gone over 2,000 subscribers. That is such a big deal to me. Yay! But I wanna to continue to grow, so if you are not already subscribed to my channel, make sure you subscribe. You don't wanna miss anything that I have coming towards you on this channel. I do true crime and makeup, as you can see. I also do snapped in skincare, also known as clean skin, dirty deeds. I also do luxury fragrance reviews and share my personal collection amongst other things like protective hairstyles. I have something for everybody you do not want to miss out. So make sure you subscribe. Also make sure you hit that notification bell so that you get notified when I post new content. Now let's get right into this story y'all. So this story was actually suggested to me by one of you, one of my busy bees. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, it was originally offered up to me as the story of Sherry Smith. Now, this obviously turned into a rabbit hole because Sherry Smith was not Larry Jean Bell's only victim. So, you know I had to cover the full story. Otherwise, I, I just wouldn't. It wouldn't be fair to you. You need to hear the whole story, right? We are gonna talk all about Larry Jean Bell, who was the man who took the life of Sherry Smith and also Deborah Faye Helmick. Let's hop on into some background on Mr. Larry. So Larry Jean Bell was born on October 30th of 1949, and he had three sisters and a brother. And it was said that they moved around a lot as kids, but he eventually graduated high school and he ended up marrying and actually having a son of his own. He also went to school and trained to be an electrician, which was a field that he later found work in. And in 1970, he joined the Marines, but that didn't even last, I don't think a full year because he was discharged after he accidentally shot himself in the knee while cleaning a gun. This is not the way to start a story. After he was discharged from the Marines, he worked for about a year as a correctional officer, and then he moved to South Carolina after that. Shortly after, in 1976, he and his wife eventually divorced, and his wife took primary custody of their son. Now, that is really all the background that I have on Mr. Larry Jean Bell. There was nothing that was, as far as I could find in his information, his background, maybe it just wasn't shared with us, but there was nothing that I could find that pointed to those typical kind of red flags that you see in the background of people who become serial killers or killers, period. Nothing seemed kind of out of the ordinary other than the fact that they moved around a lot, which makes it difficult to establish comfort and friends and a support system. Uh, but other than that, nothing, y'all. Now, let's hop right into these crimes and let's talk about these victims. So on May 31st, 1985, Sherry Smith was... A high school senior, she was 17 years old. She had just finished her final year of high school and she was just waiting, counting down the days for her graduation ceremony to take place. Now, Sherry was the daughter of a pastor by the name of Robert Smith or Bob, and her mother's name was Hilda. And she also had a sister named Dawn. Now on this particular day, you know, it's super hot outside. They live in South Carolina, so obviously it's hot. And they had just come from a 
pool party. It was Sherry and her boyfriend who had just come from a pool party. And Sherry decided that she was gonna go home after the pool party. It was kind of the middle of the day. Her dad was at home. He was in his home office and she pulled up to the property. And the house that they lived on, the property that they lived on had a very long driveway. So at the bottom of the driveway was a mailbox, the mailbox. And her dad, Bob, looked out the window and saw Sherry pull up and he saw her stop at the mailbox at the end of the driveway and she stopped to get the mail. He waited a few minutes. Sherry didn't come in. So he looked out, he still saw her car, but Sherry was not there. So he decided that he was gonna go out and go to the end of the driveway and see what was going on, see where Sherry had gone. He was somewhat worried about her because she was diabetic and not having her medicine obviously is a life-threatening situation for Sherry. When he got to the mailbox and Sherry's car, she was not anywhere to be found. The car door was still open, the car was still running, but there was no Sherry. So after this, he immediately calls the police. He calls the sheriff's office. Now, when he called the sheriff's office, they sent out the assistant sheriff. So when the assistant sheriff arrived, he talked to Bob and Bob explained to him, you know, this is very unusual for anything like this to be happening. She was a very happy teenage girl. She was getting ready to graduate. They were a close-knit family. She had never run away. This was not anything that was normal behavior for Sherry, for her to just randomly disappear. On top of that, the car is still sitting there running with the door open, and she was just there for a second getting the mail, and the next second she vanished. So although the sheriff's office typically had a 24 hour waiting period before they would do anything on a missing persons case. They felt like this was a special circumstance. There was something definitely going on there. So the assistant sheriff immediately called in for backup to assist in searching for Sherry. And even the surrounding counties joined in to help search for Sherry as well along with members of the Lexington community. Everybody was out looking for Sherry. But in the end, they came up with nothing. They found no evidence of Sherry's whereabouts whatsoever. So at this point, the sheriffs felt like they needed to call the FBI in for assistance. Now, three days later on June 3rd, they get a call in the middle of the night, the Smith family, and and there's a man on the phone and the man is talking to Bob, the father, and he asked to speak with his wife, Hilda. Now he proceeded to tell Hilda that he was the abductor of Sherry. He did not ask for any ransom from the family whatsoever. And he said that he would be returning Sherry to them safely very soon. He also mentioned that they should be getting a letter from him in the mail regarding Sherry and her return. So to be basically be out on the lookout for that. Now, as soon as police heard about this letter, supposedly, they went to the post office and they went through every piece of mail at that post office until they finally came across a letter that was addressed to the Smith family. But that letter was not at all what they were told it was gonna be and expecting it to be. The letter was actually titled as a last will and testament. They did verify that the letter was written by Sherry herself, but basically it was just a letter saying how much she loved her friends and family and that she would always be with them. And it also mentioned having a closed casket. Now that night, the Smith family got another call from the abductor and this time he was asking had they received the letter from Sherry. Now when Hilda confirmed, yes, we got the letter, he basically said, you know, at 3.01 she wrote that letter and at 4.58 
we were one. We were together in mind, body, and soul, mentally, physically, emotionally. We were one. This is where you know there is some type of mental instability happening here and it only gets worse. Now, police were able to trace the call and they were able to get a location, but unfortunately, they got there right after he had left the actual area where he made the phone call. Now, police tried to dust for fingerprints at the location where he made the phone call. Anything that can help them to identify who the caller is and he left nothing behind. No evidence whatsoever was left behind. Now, immediately after this takes place, the FBI starts to put a profile together for the abductor. So when the FBI puts the profile together, they say that he is a most likely a white male, late 20, early 30s, probably overweight, doesn't do well with women. He is of above average intelligence. He's probably a blue collar worker, maybe doing some electrical work because he did know how to kind of mask or morph his voice on the phone calls. And they also mentioned that he was a person that lived locally. He was a local person who probably has no remorse for anything that he's doing. They have no idea how right they would be. Now, two days later on June 5th, he calls the Smith family again. And this time he tells the Smith family directions of where they can find Sherry. Now he gives them these very clear directions on where to find her body. And then he ends the call by saying, we are waiting. God chose us. What? Who am I talking to? I would be, this is bananas y'all bananas. It gets worse. And it does turn out that the location and directions that he provided over the phone call was exactly where police were able to locate the body of Sherry Smith. So police found her body about 17 miles from where she lived in the woods. Now, because it was so hot outside during that time and it had been about a week that her body was out and exposed to the elements, the medical examiner was not able to immediately determine the cause of death or the time of death, which was very unfortunate. But to police, it felt like this was a very well thought out plan by the abductor because it felt like he calculated that, that he knew that if he waited a week and left her out in the elements in this heat, she would be so decomposed that there would be no way to determine either the cause of death or the time of death. The killer called the family again on the very same day as Sherry's funeral. Another family member who was not Hilda answered the phone and he asked to speak to Hilda and the family member said, oh, she's not available. And he then asked to speak with Dawn and she said, well, she's not available either. And he basically said, well, I'm just going to get off the phone if neither one of them are available to speak to me. That's who I want to talk to. So... Eventually, Don agreed to get on the phone and what he had to say. He basically told Don that the whole situation got out of hand. He really just wanted to make love to Don and he had been following her for a while. And Don was like, you to who? And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I meant Sherry. And I hope that you guys can forgive me. And she didn't suffer you don't have to worry about that and then after that happened hilda got on the phone and he told hilda again you know she didn't suffer i told her that i was going to kill her she was aware i even gave her a choice of the time and the method of which she was going to die and she chose suffocation but she knew she was going to become an angel. These are all the crazy things that he's saying to these people who have just lost their daughter and he's that person that took away their daughter. Now, because of him kind of slipping up and saying Dawn's name in the call instead of Sherry's name, police now felt like he was probably shifting his attention now to Dawn and he would possibly be coming after her next. 
Well, on December 14th of 1985, a little girl by the name of Deborah Mae Helmick was outside in her front yard with her little brother and a man pulls up and just snatches her. Now this little girl is all of nine years old and she's just minding her business with her little brother, enjoying the day and gets snatched. Now a neighbor did see all of this go down, thank God, but unfortunately the neighbor was not fast enough to respond and get little Deborah back before the abductor could pull off. He was in a car, he pulled up, he threw in the car and he pulled off. Now this took place in the neighboring county of Richland County and immediately after police were called by the neighbor, the police reached out to Lexington County Sheriff's Office because they felt like there had to be a connection of the disappearance of Sherry Smith and Deborah Helmick. And they were hoping that it would follow a similar process where they would get a phone call from the abductor and he would kind of do the same thing. And after a week, they didn't hear anything. So it kind of got them worried about the well-being, obviously, of Deborah. So what they did was they came up with this little plan, I guess you would call it. And I don't really know how I feel about this. I guess it was okay because essentially she was protected, but... What they did was they went to the Smith family and they asked the Smiths to allow Don to basically act as foam bait and see if they could re-engage the abductor again. Since again, they thought it was the same person who took Sherry that now had Deborah. Now, miraculously, Don and her family agreed to this situation. Again, I think it was because it was supposed to make them still feel protected because it was supposed to be a phone thing. But there was also another aspect to this little plan that the FBI hatched. So they took kind of a stuffed animal, it was a stuffed koala bear from Sherry's bedroom and it was supposed to act as like a bait trophy kind of thing for the killer. So they set up this memorial and they used the media to kind of push it and notify everybody that there was gonna be another memorial for Sherry. And it was in an open cemetery, so the family attended. And after this, the ceremony was over, Dawn placed flowers and this stuffed animal on the grave. That in itself, was scary, but they had the entire cemetery kind of packed with plainclothes FBI agents. So the family felt safe in doing that as well. Again, y'all, I don't know. I don't know if I do it. I don't know. But they felt safe because they wanted to get justice for their daughter. And they also wanted to be able to help save Deborah's life if at all possible. The plan worked because Later that very same night, the killer called again and wanted to talk to Don. And what he told Don was that she was going to be his next victim and she can't be protected forever. She can't be surrounded by protection forever. They will become one. And then he proceeded to also give her directions of where they can find the remains of Deborah Faye Helmick. Now, he would call repeatedly after this, doing similar things, saying similar things, and the police tried to trace the calls every time they were able to trace it, but they kept just missing him whenever they got to the location. Literally, I could just picture like a phone booth, the handle of the phone literally still dangling from him running out of the phone booth itself. That's how close I feel like they were. Now, they sent that letter that they received, the Smith family, they sent that letter to the lab to be examined for any type of forensic evidence that they could find whatsoever. And the lab actually was able to get something off of the letter. They were able to actually use this specific type of testing that kind of filled in indentations on paper 
and they were able to make out a name and a phone number on this piece of paper that you could not see with the naked eye. The name was Joe and the phone number was a phone number with an Alabama area code. So they looked up the person whose phone number uh, matched what they saw on the paper and it ended up being someone by the name of Joe Shepard. So they went to go talk to Joe. Now he didn't necessarily fit the profile or the witness account statements of the actual perpetrator. So they weren't really going to talk to him as a suspect, but they wanted to get some information to find out who had been calling him. When they got there and they talked to Joe, he tells them, yeah, somebody's calling me from South Carolina. My parents live in South Carolina. That's who's been calling me from this number. So at this point, they go back to South Carolina and now they need to talk to the shepherds. And when they get there, y'all, this case breaks wide open. So when police get to the home of the shepherds in South Carolina, they find Ellis and his wife and they're literally just pulling up to their house and police start to question them asking them you know the standard questions if they know anyone who fits the description of the suspect that they're looking for because Ellis the husband did not look at all like the description or the profile so they figured it was not him other than he was an electrician. Now police ask if there was anyone else in their household that could have been responsible, if it fit, if there's anybody that fits that description that they know of. And instantly they're like, well, you know, we've been out of town for six weeks and we just got back. We did have someone who was house sitting for us by the name of Larry Jean Bell. Now, Larry Jean Bell was also someone who assisted Ellis in his electrical jobs. So he had the electrical electrician experience that the profile said he would have. Now, they ran down the description and the profile that the FBI had developed to the shepherds and they said, yep, 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 that fits Larry to a T. And they said, you know what? He also picked us up from the airport and Lord knows he just could not stop talking about this case, the case of Sherry and the disappearance of Deborah. That is all that he could actually talk to us about, which we found to be really strange. Police also asked Ellis if he owned a gun and he said, yes, I do let me show it to you and when he went to go show it to police it was gone now police also asked the shepherds to listen to the recordings of the killer when he called the smith family and even though he tried to distort his voice the shepherds still knew that was larry jean bell so basically the shepherds told them, well, hey, he's supposed to be back tomorrow morning. We got a job to do. So he's supposed to come back early the next morning to the shepherd's house. So police set up surveillance at Larry's place of residence and basically followed him to a safe point between Larry's house and the shepherd's house and cut him off and arrested him. Now he was arrested on June 26th of 1985 and police search his home and they find Ella Shepard's missing gun. And they also find a blonde hair in his room that shows up to be an actual match to the hair of Sherry Smith. Now police sit down to talk to him and question him. And he basically says he has nothing to do with either abduction or murder nothing at all to do now police once again decide that they're going to use dawn and hilda as bait and he asks to see them in person 
And again, these strong, strong women agree. And they come down to the station. They come into the interrogation room where Larry Jean Bell is. And they confront him face to face. Now, when Larry confronts Don and Hilda Smith, they asked him, you know, are you responsible for this? Do you take responsibility for your actions? And basically he said, you know, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I did not hurt Sherry. I didn't do any of this. Maybe bad Larry did, but I did it. Now let's talk about the trial y'all. Now they tried Sherry's case and Deborah's case completely separately, but in the case of Sherry, prosecutors basically said that Larry saw Sherry with her boyfriend saying goodbye at a parking lot of a shopping center of some sort, and he followed her home. And unfortunately, Sherry never realized that she was being followed. So when they got to the mailbox of the Smith home, he basically snatched her, put her in a car, took her back to the shepherd's home, raped and assaulted her, and then suffocated her after making her write a last will and testament to her family. Now, Larry also testified himself for about six hours. Now, when I tell you his testimony did not disappoint, he just rambled. He said, just random things like Mona Lisa is a man. You just knew he was not all, all there. Now it took jurors less than an hour to convict Larry Jean Bell of the abduction and murder of Sherry Smith. And he was also found guilty for the abduction and murder of Debbie Helmick. And for his crimes, he was sentenced to death. Now, on October 4th of 1996, Larry had chosen the electric chair as his method of death versus lethal injection. So he was put to death by the electric chair on that day. Outside of the two crimes that we covered today, he's also suspected in two other disappearances of two separate women. And that is the 1984 disappearance of Sandy Elaine Cornett. And she was actually one of Larry's coworkers, girlfriends. So that was the connection. And I believe he had been to a party at her home before. So they were somewhat familiar with each other. And the other disappearance was Denise Newsom Porch, who disappeared in 1975. And she actually lived in an apartment complex near where Belle lived. And I believe she was last known to be showing a apartment to a man and she was never seen again. And both are still missing to this day. All right, guys. So that is the story of Larry Jean Bell. And this is also the final look. I was feeling real no blushy today and letting the eyes and lips speak for themselves. Y'all know I am loving the look of pink lately on my skin tone. It just feels so beautiful to me. I am definitely giving some glow from within by putting highlighter underneath my foundation. I love this palette that I bought. Yes, I am late to the game with the Novena palettes. Don't judge me, but love the palette. Very pigmented, very easy to work with, beautifully blended. Love it. But yeah, this is the final look. Tell me what you guys think of this. Also, let me know what you guys think of the story of Larry Jean Bell. I know this was supposed to be a story just about Sherry Smith's case, but I couldn't tell Sherry Smith's case without telling the case of Deborah Helmick as well, because those were both victims of the same man who met unfortunate fate by the hand of Larry Jean Bell. And he was nuts. Calling families, talking about we are now one, we were chosen by God, like just sheer craziness. 
But thank you again to the busy bee out there who suggested this story. Y'all keep those suggestions coming. I love it. I love it. I love it. Also, if you have not already subscribed, make sure you subscribe to my channel. You do not want to miss any of the looks or the skincare or the hair or the fragrance that I have coming for you guys, okay? And then finally, make sure you like the video. It means the world to me when you guys do. Make sure you comment. I love engaging with y'all. Y'all know I'm coming back at you with a comment. And yeah, y'all, it's been real. It's been so much fun doing this look today. I am gonna go enjoy some soccer with my husband, Italia, go Italia. But other than that, y'all, until next time, love you guys. Bye.